Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. All right, welcome back. Uh, as mentioned earlier, my name is Mark Lebecki. I am... Let me do a sound check. Is this all right in terms of volume? We need a little make sure it's off right into it. Is that better? Is it on? Is that better? No. I just want to play this mic. I turned it off. Oh. Uh, you mean it off? Yeah. Woo. All right, let's do that again. Oh, that helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Very excited. All right, my name is Michael Becky. I am a PhD student in religious ethics here at the Divinity School, studying under Professor Elstein. And it is again my joy to welcome everybody here. Um, if it is reasonable to measure the quality of a person who is being honored, in part at least by the quality of those who come to do the honor, uh, I have chosen my advisor well. Um, following Robin Loving, we have uh, three excellent panelists, and it is also my great pleasure to welcome them here. Uh, in fact, in various measures, it's, uh, it's a welcome back to all of you. But in particular, and limited to an academic sense, it's welcome home to two of you. As the Dean mentioned, uh, some of you have done your degrees here. Uh, both Professor Matthews and Professor Figger earned their doctorates here at Swift Hall. Do you want me to stop? No, you're good. All right. All right. Earned their doctorate here at Swift Hall. Um, and to those of us who are presently in the program, you serve as a glorious encouragement <laughs> for the prospect of release and gainful and stimulating employment. So, <laughs> bless you. With that, uh, please allow me to introduce the alien first. Professor Eric Gregory is a professor of religion at Princeton University. His teaching and research interests include. Christian ethics, moral philosophy, uh, modern theology, bioethics, political theory, and the role of religion in public life. A graduate of Harvard, he earned an MPhil in a diploma of theology uh, at Oxford while Rhodes Scholar, and a doctorate of religious studies at Princeton. Professor Gregory is author of Politics and the of Politics in the Order of Love. And numerous articles related to the interests I mentioned above. I am trying to figure out how to get this to check. There it is. He's also currently a TIFA fellow at the TIFA Center for Law and Jewish Civilization, where his research is entitled um, What Do We Owe Strangers? And he considers the parable of the Good Samaritan, examining secular and religious readings of the parables around in the contemporary debates about the limits of morality and the nature and scope of moral obligations in a global age. Now, most importantly, to my mind, on August 7th, Professor Gregory began working earnestly on what is surely to become a great part of his legacy when he and his wife welcomed into the world the young Augustinian Nick Hill Scott Gregory. <laughs> uh, and if I might quote Professor Hecker, I don't know if he's here, so I have permission to quote him I'm going to. He says, I'm looking at his birth announcement now, and he is <laughs> now, I've got pictures. This, this might be an awkward segue, but Professor Nigel Bigger <laughs> is the Regis Professor of He's War. very cute, too. Our mother's son. I didn't feel like it was my place to say it. <laughs> professor Nigel Bigger is Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral Theology at Oxford. An ordained Anglican priest, Professor Bigger's research interests include the formative bearing of religious concepts on moral life, the contribution of religion to the health of liberal society, the development of a concept of public reason that permits the engagement of metaphysically contradictory positions, and the theology and ethics of national identity and loyalty, of forgiveness, of killing, parenthetically, especially in relation to suicide, euthanasia, and war, and the bearing of the past after civil conflict. Educated at Oxford and Regent College in Vancouver, Professor Bigger earned his PhD here at the University of Chicago. Professor Bigger is author of numerous books, including Aiming to Kill, The Ethics of Suicide and Euthanasia, The Hastening That Awaits, Far Arts Ethics, Cities of Gods, 
faith and politics and pluralism and Judaism and Christianity and Islam, which was co-edited in part with Professor Schweiger. And behaving in public, how do Christians do ethics, or how to do Christian ethics? Finally, Professor Baker is also director of the McDonald Center for Theology, Ethics, and Public Life, a research institute at the University of Oxford. And finally, in chairing the panel discussion, Charles Matthews is professor of religious studies and director of the Virginia Center for the Study of Religion at the University of Virginia. His research interests are broadly in the area of Christian thought and comparative ethics, and more particularly in Augustine and Augustinian tradition, the intersection of religion, culture, politics, and public life, and evil and sin. He was educated at Georgetown and the University of Chicago, where he studied under the supervision of Professor Schweiger. And from 2006 to 2010, he edited the Journal of the American Academy of Religion. He is the author of Understanding Religious Ethics, a comparative study of Jewish, Christian, and Islamic ethics. Um, what I understand in this hard to believe, but I understand it's the first undergraduate textbook to do so. Um, so that's true. Uh, he's also the other author of The Republic of Grace, Augustinian Post for Dark Times, Evil in the Augustinian Tradition, and The Theology of Public Life. And I will turn it over to you now. All right. It was Benjamin Franklin who said uh, that experience keeps a dear school, but fools will learn in no other uh, I am certainly a fool, but I learned not just from the school of experience, but from the school of Elshane. Uh, when I came to Chicago, uh, Professor Elshane was not yet on the faculty, but Providence ensured that I would not miss that opportunity to have her both as a teacher and to sit in her office hours and listen to her talk, not just about things like Václav Havel and Hannah Arendt, but also about John Ford and Westerns. Um, and I have learned and continue to learn from her. Yeah. Because this is a political season, I will go rogue for one moment. Um, I think that this is myself and Melanie Barrett, the only uh, of, uh, Professor Elshane's students who are, are part of this, and I did want to give the chance to uh, say that uh, it's not just reading her works that is useful, it's actually listening to her and tracing out the contours of her mind that she thinks that has been especially useful for me. Uh, a few years ago, I read a book called Expert Political Judgment by Philip Tetlock, who's a psychologist who did a very interesting study how people learn what an uh, actual successful political judge, uh, judge uh, a judge of political activity, a judge of politics can be. And he came to an interesting conclusion. He said that effectively, people who are pundits or thinkers of politics one way or the other, effectively can be governed into group, group into two units. There are foxes, that is, people who have many ideas, um, and while they value coherence and systematicity, do not let that systematicity get in the way of seeing the actual texture of things on the ground, and hedgehogs, he grouped as people who are governed largely and perhaps dangerously by one single idea and tend to bend reality to understand that idea. I never thought I would be saying this about any of my teachers, but Jean Beth Yelchen is a fox. <laughs> <laughs> and, one of, and, and for me, in my um, mesomorphic tendencies towards hedgehogism, I have found again and again reading along with Jean and listening to her and talking with her, an experience um, that is maybe slightly more, believe it or not, fox-like. Today, um, the last example I gave that is the topic of today. This is putatively especially a, a panel about Augustine and the Limits of Politics, the book from 95 uh, that Jean published. Um, it took me a long time to realize that, um, for me in particular, the lesson of that book was that I had certain issues to work out um, and that when I did, I would be able to appreciate the book. Um, I've spent the last 15 years of my career, in many ways, thinking about the character of why Augustine is interesting, whether I think about public life and political life and being engaged in political life. And it's only recently that I came around to the idea, um, I helped in, in most immediate terms by Professor Baker and Gregory, that um, Augustine also wanted to say there are dangers and temptations in the political arena that we ought to be aware of. It was in thinking about this book, Elfstein's book, again for this conference, that I realized for the first time that as plain as the nose on my face, that was the point she was trying to make 17 years ago. <laughs> so I assume there are many lessons, not just in the present, but from the actual past, that I still have to learn from Professor Elfstein. 
And the speakers today, I hope, will help me and the rest of us learn some of those lessons as well. I will start with uh, Professor Bigger, and then we'll go to Professor Gregory, and then I'll have a few comments. And then we'll basically just open it up for conversation. Let's speak. Thanks very much. Um, it is a treat to be back in this room for the first time in 30 years. Uh, the last time I was in here, uh, I was one of three along with Bill Schweiker organizing the 1982 Divinity Student Association Conference. Um, now, there are many good reasons to come back to Swift Hall, uh, but uh, the opportunity to celebrate and discuss Gene Elshin's work is among the best of them, so I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, what I have to say uh, falls in five parts, and I will announce the parts uh, simply because the titles will give you the clue as to the focus of what's going to follow. So first, anthropology as apologia, question mark. Abutting the back garden of the southwest lodgings in Christchurch, Oxford, where I live, is a small building that used to supply my predecessors and medieval predecessors with beer in the days when the water couldn't be trusted. Between November 1972 and April 1973, after his departure from New York and before his departure from Vienna, it provided W.H. Orton with a home. So since I moved into the lodgings five years ago, I've been revisiting, and mostly visiting for the first time, Orton's poetry. To date, the poem that has struck me most forcibly is one that he wrote in January 1941, when he was still in America, and it's called Atlantis. Its forms are ancient Greek, but its substance is Christian. Atlantis stands for the heavenly Jerusalem, and the poem concerns the Odyssey that is a Christian life. The stance it takes is that of someone bidding farewell to an imminent voyager, and toward its end we reach this verse. Assuming you reach at last near Atlantis, and begin a terrible trek inland through squalid woods and frozen tundras where all are soon lost. If forsaken then, you stand. Dismissal everywhere. Stone and snow, silence and air, Remember the noble dead and honor the fate you are. Traveling and tormented, dialectic and bizarre. Stagger onward, rejoicing. that I hear echoes of St. Augustine in those words. I imagine it partly because I know that Orton had a high regard for Augustine on account of his ability to show, and I quote, that the Christian faith can make sense of man's private and social existence. But more exactly, I imagine it because Orton has captured the dialectical vision of human existence that I take to be Augustinian one where a human being is stretched between the exhilarating lure of eschatological hope on the one hand and the drag of sin, some of it volunteered, much of it original or inherited, on the other. Stay on, rejoicing. It's a vision that dignifies without idealizing. It saves at once from cynicism and romanticism it generates both stringent demands and deep compassion. It's a marvelously, beautifully <coughs> humane vision. Humane, not sentimental. 
And it's one that many of Christianity's most effective apologists have taken up and articulated, each in their own terms. Most famous are Pascal, Tillich, and Reinhard Niebuhr. And to this eminent list, I would add Jean Bethke Hoshain, whose work shares the intention, as I read it, of recommending the Christian theological story by displaying its power to explain and make sense of human being and existence, individual, social, and political. And not only its power, but its superior power, its power to outnarrate alternative stories, be they Hobbesian, Rousseauian, Kantian, Nietzschean, or Sartrean. Which is why Professor Elstein takes care, particularly in Augustine and Lenin's politics, but also elsewhere, to show how modern, non-Christian philosophers have often found themselves drawn back to Augustinian Christianity, among them Wittgenstein, Camus, and Arendt. This is an apologetic strategy with which I have a great deal of sympathy. Indeed, it was the main reason I first came to the Divinity School here in the late 1970s, not to study Karl Barth, but while completing a master's dissertation on Pascal to learn more about Tillich and Niebuhr of the Peter Mann and Gilkey. So I do well into the strategy, and yet I wonder about its efficacy. I wonder how effectively the cogency of Christian anthropology leads to conviction about Christian theology. Wittgenstein, Camus, and Arendt might have admired Augustine but they still declined to buy into Christianity. Similarly, Hans Morgenthau, Tarot, and other atheists from Niebuhr remain atheists, notwithstanding their admiration for Niebuhr's Christian and considerably Augustinian realism. And even now, Jürgen Habermas admits on the one hand that religious traditions, by which he means primarily Christianity, and I quote, have the distinction of superior capacity for articulating our liberal humanist moral sensibility. And yet on the other hand, rather than finding in this phenomenon moral reason for buying into religious tradition, he prefers to look for ways of translating the moral kernel out of its religious husk, apparently assuming that it will somehow retain its superior intelligibility. So I'm wondering if the oblique anthropological route really works as an apologetic strategy? Does it persuade unbelievers into theology, Christology, and eschatology? Or does it not rather lead to the downplaying of the peculiarly theological moments of the Christian narrative for the sake of retaining plausibility, as exemplified in Reinhold Niebuhr's increasing theological reticence after the irony of American history? In short, I wonder is Stanley Howard's right after all. I hope not. <laughs> Just in case that wasn't clear. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> Monotheistic moral realism against Hobbesian unrealism and legal positivism. To display the explanatory power of Christian Augustinian anthropology is one apologetic strategy. To subject social contractarianism to imminent critique, imminent critique, could be another. In her Gifford lectures, Critical, Critical History of the Concept of Sovereignty, Professor Elshen exposes the inadequacies of contractarian political philosophy, whose lineage she traces back to nominalist or voluntarist theology. This story could be used to recommend the explanatory virtues of what I shall call, for want of a better term, logical theology, by which I mean an understanding of God as one freely bound by his own logos, and whose creation is consequently rational and humanly graspable in terms of law. If that was the intent, however, then it does not seem to have worked for Michael Walzer who in his warm, back-covered plaudits of sovereignty writes, and I quote, 
But the most remarkable fact about this powerful book is that one can appreciate and endorse its critique of the adulteries of state and self without accepting its view of divine sovereignty. I confess I rather hope the opposite, that one couldn't appreciate the one without being moved to accept the other. Certainly there is a one-way logical connection from logical theism to culturally transcendent universal natural law, and there might be a reverse connection too. Part of the meaning of the monotheistic assertion that there is one God without rival is that the world of God's creating is basically coherent and rational, not divided and anarchic. Since this created order is not just physical but moral, <coughs> monotheists are bound, I think, to be moral realists. That is, they are bound to believe in a universal moral order or reality. However, it is not so clear that this logic works in reverse. It is not so clear that belief in moral realism logically inclines to belief in one God. On the one hand, some moral philosophers evidently feel able to hold one without the other. On the other hand, many philosophers do associate the concept of God with that of a given moral order, and since they regard the latter as the enemy of human freedom, they repudiate the former. Whatever its logical connection to theism, Christian moral realism does have the considerable merit of overrating the degrading Hobbesian anthropology that so many contemporary social and political philosophers are so oddly keen to endorse. <coughs> oddly, oddly because it seems to me that the anthropology of Hobbes is so degrading that these philosophers without exception are um, perhaps unreflective humanists. But I don't see how the two could possibly coexist. If Hobbes is to be believed, human beings are basically motivated by one thing only, the desire for material security, or as I sometimes put it, the desire to be safe and fat. <laughs> While that might be true in the abstract conditions dreamed up by game theorists in prisoner's dilemmas, it is not true as an empirical generalization. Even soldiers in battle usually care more about being loyal to their mates than saving their own skins. And since their loyalty often involves their own deaths, it cannot be explained in terms of a self-regarding strategy of reciprocity. No, Thomas Aquinas and Joseph Butler were the realists, not Hobbes. We humans are moved both by self-interest and by benevolence, and we care not only for the good of self-preservation, but also, and sometimes above all else, for the good of friendship. Professor Elstein's Christian assertion of moral realism necessarily and rightly leads her to relativize positive law. Beyond positive law, there is a higher law to which appeal can be made. If that were not so, Bonhoeffer and his July 1944 complotters were simply criminal traitors and not first and foremost moral heroes. What applies on the, on the domestic stage also applies on the international one, as Elshtay made plain in her book Just War and Terror. International positive law cannot have the last word. So Karl Schmitt was not wrong to claim that there must be a sovereign who decides the exception to the law, and who therefore stands above it. Any conscience does that. He was wrong, however, to suppose that human sovereigns who stand over positive law do not at the same time stand under natural law. Those who make exceptions, as sometimes they ought, nevertheless remain responsible and are obliged to give a justificatory account of their decision. So whatever else we think about the legitimacy of the US and UK invasion of Iraq in 2003, it stands to the credit of Tony Blair that he pressed George Bush to have the coalition go before the UN Security Council to be accountable and to make a case. And it stands to George Bush's credit that he agreed. Part three, love's dirty hands. About six months after Orden left Oxford, I arrived to begin my undergraduate study of history 
At the end of which, I took a course on the life and times of St. Augustine. I was immediately hooked. Several things hooked me, but one of them was Augustine's struggle to be responsible in the midst of the inherited mess of human life. To be faithful under the burdens of history. He struggled, if you like, to honor his fate. This struck me as admirably, movingly, honest and brave. Until I read Professor Elstein's work, I hadn't noticed that Augustine takes as his model of human being not the fantasy of the self-sufficient adult, but the fact of the infant, born into a place and time that he didn't choose and vulnerable to all sorts of forces beyond his control. Nor had it occurred to me to say of Augustine, as Jean Elstein does, that he was in love with the world, which he once described as a smiling place. In that light, Augustine's resolve to honor that his fate was not just honest and brave, it was also and foremost an expression of love for the world, and more exactly, for human well-being. It was out of love for human welfare that Augustine was willing to remain fully involved in the world, in spite of all of its burdens and constraints, its intractable mess, and its terrible dilemmas. It was out of love that he was willing to risk hurting his hands. One passage in Augustine's writings that has haunted me for the past 35 years appears in the sixth chapter of Book 19 of the City of God, where he reflects on the terrible inadequacies and ironies of human justice, but equally on its necessity. I quote, What are those judgments passed by men on their fellow men, which cannot be dispensed with in cities, however much peace they enjoy? What is our feeling about them? How pitiable, how lamentable do we find them? For indeed, those who pronounce judgment cannot see into the consciences of those on whom they pronounce it. And so they are often compelled to seek the truth by torturing innocent witnesses. And what about torture employed on the man in his own case? The question is whether he is guilty. He is tortured, and even the innocent he suffers for a doubtful crime, a punishment about which there is no shadow of doubt, and not because he is discovered to have committed it, but because it is not certain that he did not commit it. This means that the ignorance of the judge is often a calamity for the innocent. In view of this darkness that attends the life of human society, will our wise man take his seat on the judge's bench, or will he not have the heart to do so? Obviously, he will sit, for the claims of human society constrain him and draw him to his duty. And it is unthinkable, it is unthinkable that he should show it. In an earlier letter to Paulinus of Nola, where he discusses the use of coercion against the Donatists, Augustine shows how acutely he feels the anguish of his predicament. Again, I quote, On the subject of punishing or refraining from punishment, what am I to say? It is our desire that when we decide whether or not to punish people, in either case, that you contribute wholly to their security. These are indeed deep and obscure matters. What do we do when as often happens? Punishing someone will lead to his destruction, but leaving them unpunished, will lead to someone else being destroyed. Trembling and fear have come upon me, and darkness has covered me. And I said, who will give me wings like a dove's? Then I will fly away and be at rest. But Augustine did not fly away, nor did he shut his eyes. Such a man, such love, such honesty, such courage, surely deserves to be followed. Jean Elshane follows him. Placing myself in a minority among contemporary Christian intellectuals and feminists, and perhaps even among academics in general, she does not flinch in affirming the necessity of coercion, even while acknowledging its dangers and its moral murkiness. Here she makes a rare, and to me surprisingly rare, invocation of Ramon Nebo. Even more than this, and even worse in some eyes, she affirms the necessity of punitive coercion. For example, against the Al-Qaeda harboring regime in Afghanistan, 
The proposal that just war is probably punitive is not popular, even among those who acknowledge that it might be necessary. In the minds of too many, punishment is indistinguishable from retribution, which is indistinguishable from vengeance. Those who have drunk at Augustine's well, however, know that this is not true. If they've been further enlightened by Richard Swinburne, they will also recognize that a hostile response to one who has caused damage to something valuable, which is what punishment is, is the only way of paying him the respect of taking his agency seriously. And unless he immediately repudiates what he's done, it's also the only way that he might be prompted to repent. Therefore, not to punish, not to retribute in a broad sense, is to fail in love for the wrongdoer. It's also, of course, to fail in love for the good he's damaged. Part four and five. Entitled Forgiveness and Justice, Possible Impossibilities. If love sometimes requires punishment, if it must take the form of kind harshness, as of Jesus Augustine's phrase, then by the same token, it sometimes forbids forgiveness, insofar as forgiveness amounts to absolution. Here is another topic on which Professor Elstein has developed Augustinian wisdom. The avoidance of cheap forgiveness, its properly judgmental character, and both the possibility and limits of its political expression. Before I focus on the limits, let me dwell for a moment on the possibility. Elstein's admission of the possibility of forgiveness operating in political life marks one mild point of divergence from Reinhold Niebuhr. I see the divergence because Niebuhr contraposed the self-sacrificial forgiving love that can operate in interpersonal relations and the coercive justice that must operate in larger scale economic and political relations. Against sentimental social gospels, he was at pains to insist that in the midst of raging class or interstate conflict, to enjoy mere love upon the oppressed is to invite them to play doormat. While some of those possessed by greed or fear or hatred might be disarmed by such love's bold beauty, in most, it will inspire violent contempt. History shows us so. In holding, rightly in my view, that love as forgiveness can find limited political expression, Elstein distinguishes herself from Nebo. Still, I say that the divergence is mild because we shouldn't overdraw the contrast. Nebo did admit that the impossible ideal of love can and should be efficacious in raising justice's head above the waters of vindictiveness. So it turns out that the ideal is not so impossible after all. Now let me turn to the from the possibility of political forgiveness to its limits. In her essay, Politics and Forgiveness, Professor Elstein tells us that, and I quote, there are wrongs suffered that can never, never be put right especially wrongs on a massive scale. And that forgiveness consists partly in acknowledging this, not simply a forgetting, but a knowing forgetting. Now I applaud the forthright acknowledgement of how much justice has not and cannot be done. <coughs> but I wonder why the acknowledgement is supposed to generate forgiveness rather than sullen resignation or bitter cynicism or nihilistic despair. My own view is that atrocious injustice on a massive scale compels us to confront the natural fragmentariness of all human justice. For here, the political and financial constraints become plain. For sure, here as elsewhere, one may hope to do some justice for some of the survivors, though little for the dead. But here, the numbers of dead are too great for us to overlook. Here, justice too seems largely an impossible ideal. This raises a series of questions. Can we continue to gaze upon the vast sea of unvindicated dead without hope and yet still with care? Or shall we preserve hope 
by ceasing to care for the hopeless, rationalizing and dismissing them as the inevitable refuse of an emancipating historical process, as some have put it. But would not such a rationalizing of the unrelieved suffering of others diminish our own humanity with callousness? How then can we acknowledge the mountainous horizon of unfinished and, secularly speaking, unfinishable judicial business and still prevent our commitment to justice from hardening into utilitarian ruthlessness or sinking into despairing inertia? One answer to these questions lies in the traditional Christian and Jewish notion of eschatological hope. Hope that beyond the world of time and space and by the superhuman power of God, the vast majority of victims who have received no justice in this world, and the rest who have received only fragments and tokens of it, will yet be fully vindicated. It was just such a hope to which I instinctively resorted after seeing the film Katim, Andre Weider's 1999 movie about the Soviet massacre in 1940 of 22,000 Polish soldiers, police officers, and intellectuals. Stunned by the film's dreadful climax, I stumbled out of the cinema, muttering to myself, there has to be a hell, there has to be a hell for Stalin and all his assembly like murderers. I'm glad to have a chance to mention uh, Viber because if you have read Jean Hushtakin's work, you'll know she's something you'll film of. And in her book, Sovereignty, she mentions um, uh, one of the Bible's earlier movies, uh, Danton, which is also excellent. Not cheerful, but excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Max Horkheimer has pointed out, the monstrousness of the thought that there is no final justice, no vindication of the wrong dead, does not amount to a cogent argument for the contrary just as it's monstrous as it is true. But so, and it constitutes a major challenge to Christian theology and philosophy, I think. Eschatological fulfillment is essential to a Christian vision of things, and eschatological hope is essential to Christian moral life. This is something that Christian theologians and ethicists have not been shy in affirming to each other, and in places like this. But when they turn to unbelievers, they tend to become tongue-tied and resident about it, as did Nebo. They fall silent, I assume, because they think they lack a robust public defense. My own feeble starting point is to say that if eschatological hope is necessary to render rational an acceptance of the severe limits of sexual justice, that is not acquiescent, but expectant, not resigned, but resolute. And if the rightness of that resoluteness seems to us quite as true as anything else we believe in, then that is one reason for supposing eschatological hope to be true too. However, even if there is a decent start, it is only a start. We need much more if eschatological hope is to be distinguishable from childish wishful thinking. Final part five, pastoral empathy for embodied decision makers. Whether treating political forgiveness in South Africa or the USA's war against Afghanistan, Professor Elshane displays an admirable sensitivity to the plight of those who carry political responsibility, the burden bearers of the world, as Nebo and Nicely called them. For example, she accused critics of the US attacks on Taliban Afghanistan for their indifference to the real foreign policy dilemmas that men and women in government have to face, for ignoring the fog of war and for assuming a false clarity. The astute British political commentator Timothy Garden Ash has written that when you get a few glimpses into the way major foreign policy decisions are made, you are left with a sense of mild incredulity that this is how the world is run. It is vital that we all appreciate this simple truth about our rulers. Half the time, they really don't know what they're doing. 
such a statement tends, though not in this context, I notice, <laughs> to give rise to a ripple of smug laughter. <laughs> As if to say that if I were, if we were in their shoes, we'd know what we were doing. But of course we wouldn't. Anyone who's had a charge of running an organization, even something as modest as a university department, knows that there are times when you have no choice but to fly that seat through pants. And what's true of a university department is true in spades of a national government in a contemporary democracy. As Tony Blair writes in his autobiography, the pace of modern politics and the intrusion of media scrutiny mean that decisions have to be made, positions taken, strategies worked out and communicated with a speed that is the speed of light. I believe that I read somewhere, though I can't now find out where, that the average length of a decision-making meeting in Dublin is 30 minutes. Though I did ask two civil servants last night in night whether that was plausible, and they said not. Presumably, the final decision-making meeting stands on the pyramid of other meetings. Nevertheless, Tony Blair's point is probably true. Nowadays, the speed of decisions that our governments have to make the modern democracies under the glare of the media is extremely fast. Uh, they don't have the kind of leisure that you and I academics have. Before setting out to judge the world as they must, Christian prophets should stop reading it at a safe distance through the lens of abstract concepts that caricature as much as they describe. And when judging the deeds of rulers, Prophets owe the judge due appreciation of the conditions under which they have to act, lest prophecy become slander. Christian prophets owe this specific form of neighbor love to rulers. Augustine showed it in his pastoral correspondence with military tribunes such as Marcellinus and Boniface, and Jean Elstein shows it in her feminist version of Christian realism with its acute awareness of the embodied nature of human moral agents. Would that such fraternal or sisterly empathy were more common among Christian intellectuals? Thanks very much. So I begin with the confession that I'm experiencing the, the distension of time. Chuck, you can put that on. Uh, we're going to learn about, uh, Dean, Dean Mitchell talked about disciplined curiosity. I'm beginning to learn about undisciplined curiosity uh, in, in, in our home. So my talk has two parts. Uh, first, I focus on Professor Elshane's reading of Augustine. Second, I turn more briefly to what we might call her applied Augustinianism, focusing on two important issues in modern politics, torture and humanitarian intervention. Along the way, I hope to make good on my title, Taking Love Seriously, El Shane's Augustinian Voice and Modern Politics. Last week, I found myself giving a talk at Columbia University to the faculty, and truth be told, mostly graduate students who teach their famed uh, required sophomore course, Contemporary Civilization. I was invited to speak about techniques for teaching Augustine's City of God, which I took delight in that invitation of the technique for teaching Augustine's City of God, of which they read selections in one week in their uh, sort of forced march from Plato's Republic to Virginia Woolf's Three Guineas, which is now the last book of contemporary civilization in Columbia. <laughs> Before turning to the text itself, I reminded them that President Obama may have read City of God as a Columbia sophomore, or at least his undergraduate days. And he's supposedly now bypassing what we know of as professed admiration for Reinhold Niebuhr is going ad fontes and has been reading Augustine in thinking about the ethics of drone strikes. 
So you never know who you're going to be teaching and what you might teach them. <laughs> Professor Elstein dedicates her book to Augustine, to those who taught her well. Augustine had a lot to say about teaching, anxious about his false teachers, and at his most confessional, the influence of his teaching. After a dutiful discussion of the difficulties of entering Augustine's historically distant, enchanted world, how to relate to the God to confessions, and the noble lies we might tell theologically illiterate undergraduates in one session about Augustine, I was struck by one of the questions from the Columbia audience. Now, Augustinians are often accused of gloomy pessimism, though I usually I confess, have to work hard to get my Princeton students, who maybe have read too much Foucault, but have been trained in the arts of suspicion, and are committed to a policy wonk approach to the ills of the world, to appreciate Augustine's puncture of the illusions of Roman glory. I don't have idealists in my classroom in the same way that maybe Michael Bieber did in his day. But I tried hard to get the students to understand what Augustine saw as the conceits of the idealistic ambitions of Rome. But my question asks an interesting area of this question of pessimism. Why is Augustine so polemical, was the question. Why is he so anxious about the pagans and their culture of honor? Now, I won't here rehearse my response, though much could be said about the culture of rhetoric in Augustine's ancient world, his nuanced attitude to the classical inheritance that we've already heard about from Professor Ladin that he was transforming into a theological idiom, and why it disturbed this classicist who asked me the question. Augustine, indeed, I think, was a culture warrior, to use a sometime pejorative term today. He was preoccupied with the distortions of excessive attachment to finite goods that marked his society, and he wrote at a time of great uncertainty and moral panic. You know, by my lights, he was harsher on the practices of his culture than its various believers, though, of course, he always brought together theory and practice to his critique, because he thought pagan culture did not have the conceptual, linguistic resources to adequately name its self-deception. Its perversity was repressed, an important theme, I think, in Professor Elstein's own social criticism. Bad theology, for Augustine, funded bad ethics. And he refused to stick to the surface moral complaints that could be found in any old Roman philosopher, or dare I say, in any old typical church sermon today, indulging in the prophetic speech that one could find on MSNBC or Fox, so you don't have to go to church to hear about it. In a wonderful yet, I think, neglected essay, Judith Schlar numbers Augustine among those rare thinkers who, as she puts it, take injustice seriously. Rather than focus on what she calls a complacent justice model of confident trust in institutions of fair rules, and here we might think of Ronald Dworkin's high liberalism taking rights seriously. Augustine Perschlar is one of the few political thinkers impressed by the scope of injustice, the many ways in which we all learn to live with each other's injustices that are ignored, and the ways in which the relation of private injustice is related to public order. Augustine took injustice seriously even if it could escape any narrative explanation in his telling of the sinful conformity to the world that we hear about in Romans 12. His account of the misery of social life was more than a diagnosis of garden variety selfishness, and it has sponsored otherworldly withdrawal and worldly engagement, often swinging between a kind of hyper uh, platonic spirituality and a hyper-stoic respect for responsibility in the world, something to which I return at the end. The genius of Augustine, I think, in that book, is the way he frames theology, especially Pauline theology, as a kind of sociology, 
anchored by that overarching appeal to the biblical imagery of Babylon and Jerusalem, two rival entities shaped by two rival loves, entangled with one another in hidden ways throughout history. Modern readers find in this the origins of ideology critique. Even Noam Chomsky can't resist Augustine's inspired retelling of the pirate's response to Alexander the Great in Book 4. Others, of course, find only ideology itself, an ideology of exclusion, still unconfessed. Augustine never gives his therapy to himself. As Professor Elstein's former student, political theorist Roman Coles puts it in his treatment of Augustine, it's difficult to write of generosity today without conjuring up images of terror wrought by a religion, mainly Augustinian Christianity, that at once placed the movement of caritas in agape, giving in love at the foundation of being, and swept across the Americas during the conquest, and I have this turn of phrase, with a holocaust of generosity, a holocaust of love. Now, given the various crusades of love, often violent, that we know of, I suspect some people get nervous when a Christian tells them they're going to love them. Uh, though since we're in Chicago, I mentioned this yesterday during one of our sessions, I wrote a somewhat playful essay on Augustine's notion of compelling them to come in with Cass Sunstein's notion of nudging citizens to make um, better preferences um, so that their lives would go well. In general, however, love is a word that dare not speak its name among Christian Augustinian realists. Fearful of accusations of sentimentalism. Wary of, like those Roman critics who said to Augustine, what is this meek religion of the Sermon on the Mount? It's here I want to turn to Elshane's Augustine in particular because what I find wonderful is she is not embarrassed as a realist by Augustine's heart. And thank her as one of my teachers who never took a class with her for the way she wears her learnedness so lightly in the Augustine book that it gives permission to the rest of us in the heated world of Augustinian studies to say something about Augustine and politics. Like Professor Elstein, I was introduced to Augustine through political realism. She, through her teacher Kenneth Waltz in international relations realist. Myself, through my father, who worked for the State Department and was a latter-day atheist for neither. In Achieving Our Country, Richard Rorty brings together Reinhold Bieber and Jean Elstein and says they both take the notion of sin seriously. But one of Elstein's central insights about Augustine and her own Augustinian voice is she takes love seriously, highlighting the way in which even the language of justice demands examination of the character of a people in terms of the objects of love. What you love most is the essence of your character reveals the essence of your character. That to which your will is turned, and Augustine tell us true virtue, tells us true virtue is rightly ordered love. So, unlike dominant conceptions of persons in political science, namely that we are sets of interests or utility maximizers, Elstein again and again helps us appreciate Augustine's fundamental notion that human beings and the communities they constitute are bundles of loves often disordered loves in need of therapy, being in Chuck's own work, but loves nonetheless. In rereading Augustine and the Limits of Politics, I found, uh, you know, when you read those books that you haven't read in some time, you find those marginalia that you wrote when you read them uh, that are wonderful. I was happy to recollect that I first read this book during a period of my own soul searching following my graduate school exams. The time when Professor Elstein tells us she also returned to Augustine. Like Augustine's reading of Cicero, my reading of Elstein inspired a way of thinking about Augustine and his subversive relation to modern politics by emphasizing the centrality of love. Not simply for his moral psychology or his ethics, which has been a dominant discussion in Augustinian studies, but thinking about the relationship of love to his politics. Now, I won't rehearse also my own argument about the way realist and liberal appropriations of Augustine have neglected or distorted his admittedly difficult phenomenology of love, 
by only focusing on this significant doctrine of sin. But in my book, I claim that Elsheim represents, quote, the most promising example of Augustinian civic liberalism, my preferred uh, vision of Augustinian politics. And despite its, I think, misleading, realist-sounding title, The Limits of Politics, her book, I think, is an important example of an emerging consensus in the 1990s that realism and Rawlsian neutrality failed to adequately theorize a needed revival of Republican conceptions of civic virtue. To be sure, I would not want to take her reading of Augustine out of a kind of realist camp, a better realism. She knows our control over the world is limited. But rather than make sin the ground of her defense of the limits of politics, she turns to Augustine's confessional affective anthropology out-narrating the egoism and thin selves of liberal political theory by highlighting the way in which we have God-given reason and the capacity for love, as well as a lust for domination. Taking Augustine away from his Hobbesian readers or his world-denying mystics, she charts how his pilgrim theology relies on the claim that dependence on others is not diminution, but enrichment of self. For Augustine is not an analytic philosopher stuck with propositions, but an observer of humanity and of human life, a conversation partner for Wittgenstein, Pavel, Rent, Sartre, Camus. And unlike my colleague Elaine Pagels, Elshane's Augustine ushers in a valuable moral revolution, compassion for others that I also agree is an intellectual waterstone. Her casual aside that Augustine's metaphors are fascinatingly feminine, and his buttressing feminist claims that the public and private are not hermetically sealed off inspired my effort to read Augustine in a more constructive relationship to contemporary feminist political theory. Though I think uh, Professor Elstein does not share some of my judgments about this relationship, uh, though I think it's more a debate about the connection between feminist political theory and welfare state liberalism than necessarily some of the um, normative judgments of the ethics of care. But in many ways, my reading of Augustine is an extended effort to confirm her judgment about Augustine's love affair with the world that Professor Bigger mentioned. The Augustine writes with wonder about flowers, about leaves, about oddities, about rarities, the quotidian, and the final hope. Augustine thinks that if God is in solidarity with human beings through the incarnation, then creatures can enjoy the gifts of God in this time, in this world, even if we are perennially tempted to enjoy them in the wrong way. Most of the 20th century interest in virtue in Augustine, in the wake of Anders Niebuhr's critique of his notion of caritas, was preoccupied with the relationship between self-love and love of God. Niebuhr and Rary that Augustine corrupted the purity of Christian love, agape, by lodging it within a platonic structure of desire to possess the good, errors. One of Elstein's insights into Augustine, however, is the way in which he indexes the language of virtue, not just in terms of self-love and love of God, but to an account of sociality, the fascination with ways in which language itself shapes historical communities, and that our prolific glimpses of God, like Augustine's vision of Ostia in Ad Ostia in the Confessions, happen not by himself in his inward journey, but in communion with others. Highlighting this incarnational social perspective is a way, I think, to revive a political Augustinianism that affirms civic virtues, a kind of secularity, without abandoning the proper realist notion of the limits of civic life and the libido dominanti. Let me turn to her applied Augustinianism. Before it became chic, Elstein refused a rigid separation of religion from politics, and more importantly to my mind, the theological from the political. She writes not only intellectual history by way of apologetic, though there's plenty of that in her stories about the development of Western politics, but as a theorist and citizen, she fluidly employs theological language as a frame of reference, a vocabulary for contributions to public life. Her Augustinian voice always rooted in the particularity of her experience, is not preoccupied with her experience. 
as so many of the self-consumed selves of modernity. Against them, Elshane warns that to find in Augustine, in the Confessions, only evidence of the triumph of Western logocentrism is to have a heart of stone and a head of brick. I wish I could have written that sentence. <laughs> I think being trained by analytic philosophers has corrupted my ability to write uh, in ways that Jean does. George Limbeck once told me, to my surprise, that he thought Reinhold Niebuhr was the last public intellectual to effectively present the Christian faith to a broadly educated audience. Those of you who know George Limbeck's theology will understand my surprise. Here we enter the domain of Professor Bader's critical remarks in the beginning. Limbeck's claim has always led me to wonder, despite my own party and sensibilities, if generic theism, or even ethical monotheism, is as bad as Stanley Howard Watts makes it out to be. Augustine could praise the platonic piety of monotheism. It was real, though of course in the end it was tragic because their pride got in the way of their ability to see the true Christian path, and it endorsed the imperialism of Rome. But I think for Augustine it had that Churchillian virtue of being better than other options. Perhaps what Augustine calls in City of God 519 an imperfect kind of virtue. Not a false religion, but a not completely true religion. In fact, in fact, apart from being the great critic of empire, Augustine would often write to public officials encouraging them to use their offices with humility, lamenting necessity, to promote Christian morals, but that they should also, quote, tolerate any earthly peace provided it does not impede the religion by which we are taught that the one supreme and true God is to be worshipped. 1917. It's not a fully Christological confession of faith. Now, what does Elshane's God language look like in concrete situations? So let me briefly read these before I end two controversial topics, if only to put them on the table. In her 2004 essay, Reflections on the Problem of Dirty Hands, she does not cite Augustine, but it is a recognizable, familiar Augustinian voice, a deeply Niborian one. My question is, is it adequately Augustinian? In the essay, we see the two main questions raised by the practice of torture. One is whether or not it's ever morally justified, and the second is whether it should be allowed under law. Now, everyday life vexes us with situations where doing evil to achieve good, or at least choosing between lesser evils, or even at least managing the moral anguish of our complicity with evil, those are three different things, seems the only intelligible course of action. The desire for moral purity, as Professor Elstein puts it, appears unrealistic and in fact is harmful to ourselves and others. She chastises, quote, legalistic versions of pietistic rigorism in which one's own moral purity is ranked above other goods. We should be willing, quote, to incur moral guilt when the lives of others are at stake. Now, my undergraduates love moral dilemmas. At least in classrooms, they love talking about them. <laughs> they especially love the fictional philosophical examples that conjured up by analytic philosophers about trolleys running out of control, fat men in caves, um, philosophy 101. I worry that I indulge their adolescent mentality with too many of these dilemmas. But I tell myself, well, this is a good pedagogical way to test their basic intuitions, even if most of the time I think it bullies them into intuitions I think they should not have. Namely, don't worry about your moral purity. Over the past decade, however, we have been having an all too real debate in our churches and our public life about the use of torture in a war on terror. Elshane argues in the essay that Christian tradition is neither deontological nor utilitarian. Calling that other member, H. Richard, she argues Christian casuistry seeks to answer question where responsibility lies in particular circumstances. In brief, she concludes the answer concludes that torture is a horror, but there are moments when a rule against torture may be overridden. 
quote, far moral, far greater moral guilt falls on a person in authority who commits the deaths of the hundreds of innocents rather than choosing to torture one guilty or complicit person. For Elstein, importantly, it's not about choosing evil to do good, but choosing the lesser two evils. We might be sad that we have to do this, but we're not doing bad. We regret that necessity requires the tragic choice. We lament our decision. We recognize that we are violating, in some sense, a norm. And in that recognition of lament, we reassert the norm. Of course, much depends on what the definition of torture is, um, and uh, her own appeal to torture light raises the question of definitions. President Bush, for example, was clear the U.S. does not torture, it interrogates. But critics argue, some scales you shouldn't be on. Definition hunting is a sign of corruption itself. A husband shouldn't want to know how much pushing and shoving qualifies as domestic violence. A public official shouldn't want to know how much beating and deprivation is torture. Christians should see the face of Christ in the most vulnerable. Even the enemies who do not see him. Torture is a defilement of a human creature. Information gained through torture is a tainted good. Augustine Lewis of Politics is a confessional work, one whose author admits unsure wandering from Wittenberg to Rome with her companion Augustine. There are many Catholic Niborians today. But in her writings, Professor Elstein often compares a Lutheran, Bonhoefferian, Niborian, post-fall Augustine of our justification, and a Thomist, John Paul II, some kind of natural law of creation is good, Augustine, of our sanctification. And in an essay, she invokes Michael Walter's own comparison of Protestant and Catholic conscience. In his recent book, Walter actually says the great theme politically of the Bible is hostility to politics. It's for the Gentiles to do these things. Praise God, pass the ammunition to the Protestants. <laughs> but how does this relate to her stance on torture? These two Augustines, the Protestant Augustine and the Catholic Augustine. Most of my Thomas friends, for example, Jean Porter and Robbie George, draw a stark line in the sand on torture adopting strong prohibitions as an expression of our shared humanity, even with the accused terrorists who's about to bomb the schoolhouse. Other Christian intellectuals, such as Jeremy Waldron and George Hunsinger, argue the secular debate about torture should benefit from clear Christian witness to the sacredness of all life, lest we be overwhelmed by the soft consequentialism or antinomian appeal to necessity in the face of the demand for security. Does Professor Elstein, and if so, where, register such issues in relation to torture? How might her Catholic faith now read Augustine's description of the judge's cry in 1906 that Nigel Baker read? How far apart can we hold our assessment of our actions from our assessment of our agency? Can we ever do something that we regret, but is still right to do. More quickly, in her writings on humanitarian intervention, Professor Elshane, I think, forcefully invokes the Augustinian notion of neighbor regard, concern for the vulnerable that inspired just war thinking. In the interest of time, I'm going to lead to one side of particular judgments about particular interventions, though I also want to say I admire her candor about the realities of American power her willingness to get beyond legal frameworks and ask important questions about the kind of society we want to be. And unlike so many so-called prophetic voices in the church, her apt distinctions between the failures of American politics and other societies. And since we're mentioning films, I watched the other night Shadow of a Doubt by Hitchcock, which is, I think, the greatest Augustinian film of the 20th century. It's an indictment of the pretension to innocence of America. 1942 comes out for failure to intervene to help the victims of Nazis. The wonderful film. But my interest here is just one conceptual question, not an empirical one. 
It's related to this question of moral dilemmas, but not torture. It's from the other angle. angle. Much of her invocation of just war, like Paul Ramsey, trades on its origins in Christian charity. Now, apart from the big theological question is, how do we understand what we do in this life? How does it relate to our eschatological destiny? I think intervention presses another question about our loves. It's the flip side of love's counsel to do no harm. It's Ramsey's good Samaritan question about helping others. As Ramsey put it, what do you think Jesus would have made the Samaritan do if he had come upon the scene while the robbers were still at their fell work? Professor Elshin has invoked this story in her own writings, and many others now today invoke it in the face of ethnic conflict, genocide, various humanitarian crises from Somalia to Syria. For example, one international law professor, I think, concretized Ramsey's question during the limited NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. What would the man going from Jerusalem to Jericho have felt had the Samaritan, instead of putting him on his own beast and taking him to an inn for safety, merely thrown stones at the thieves from his donkey as he passed by, (laughs) by which he then precipitated murder and sexual abuse because there was no one present to offer the victim protection when it was needed. Now, just worth thinking today, I think, is undergoing an effort to correlate notions of retribution to self-defense to the protection of persons. And Elshane, I think, offers a welcome appeal to social charity, her effort to get beyond the stark choice between the spontaneity of immediate personal encounter and thinking in complex social ways about charity. Many people are now exposing the pieties of liberal sentiment as a pretext for a new imperialism. Charles Taylor's A Secular Age, for example, is only the most recent example of a Catholic voice that I think is indicting Protestants for endowing a kind of frenzied quest to help other people. Humanitarian interventions are notorious for their capacity to cause more harm than good, and many consider them a cheap way of avoiding long-term development. But I think the more standard view is that humanitarian interventions are superrogatory. A failure to intervene might display a lack of virtue, but it does not constitute a violation of justice. Most Christians find it hard to defend an imperative to violence as an outgrowth of Christian charity. But there are some who argue that humanitarian intervention is in fact a perfect duty, demanded by respect for humanity when fundamental human rights are violated. So my question, based on Elstein's notion of charity, what is the normative status of a humanitarian intervention if all the relevant just war criteria are fulfilled? Is such an intervention an obligation? Or is it mere permission for some actor to act? Does the failure of the United States to intervene in Rwanda mean that those victims have a moral claim against us? That we had an obligation to intervene, not just permission to do so? Now, whether or not such a prudential judgment can be made ex ante, I think, is particularly difficult, but not unique to intervention. The really interesting theological problem is whether, through no fault of our own, we find ourselves in these dilemmas, whether actions of harm or failure to act. Just curious to hear how the Augustinian tradition today, whether on the Protestant or Catholic side of that tradition, understands such dilemmas. Let me end. Elshay opens Augustine Limits of Politics with a passage from De Trinitate, in which he says, A lecture is good if it instructs and admonishes. I'm thankful for Jean Elshay's consistent voice that takes love seriously and in so doing instructs and admonishes a culture that, like in Augustine's day, I think is unsure of its deepest commitment. It's searching for a shared moral vocabulary that might bind us without breaking us. A space for loyalty and love and care and a chastened form of virtue. Elstein tells us, Augustine asks us not so much how to control an old self, 
but how to bring a transformed one into being? That's the hard question without answers that fit on bumper stickers. How do we change things? How do we bring about transformation? Augustinians, by reputation and example, tend not to go in for the holy, changey thing. They offer a cautious wisdom, sparing us the thrill of revolution, Pelagian fantasy. We should use politics, but don't enjoy it. He says the same thing about sex. But to end where I began, the city of God never loses its anti-pagan polemic, but I think from Book 10 it starts to fade. What he was trying to offer was a vision of healing, of wholeness, and intimacy that will characterize those shaped by grace, disciplined by love, to desire the good in the right way at the right time. He tells us, even in that most social political book, that the most fundamental battles are not those outside of ourselves, but within, not other men's, but our own. And at the end of the day, what he was trying to do in those long books that are harder to read was offer for a confused, disillusioned, anxious church and culture something to live for rather than simply something to stand against. And I think that, in many ways, is what Gene L. Shane's writing has been about. A lot of recent political theology is an exercise in genealogy. Contested genealogies play a significant role in the academic study of religion. Professor Elstein is too careful to jump from origins to application in her own tapping of the wellsprings of the Christian tradition. But I worry that we're entering a time in the academy and in our public life where appeals to intellectual history no longer carry any normative purchase, especially if they have theological origins. The value for doing political theology for many is seen only as a curious past of antiquarianism. In a recent book, Paul Kahn said, learning the theological origins of political concepts is about as interesting as learning that English words began in Old Norse. It's curious, but it has no theoretical value today. Now, many of my humanist colleagues are fascinated by theology, but they say the past is irrelevant. And the best philosophers and ethicists today, to my mind, never engage contemporary theology. After I discuss Augustine's views with them, or Grotius, or others that Jean Elstein has written about, they say, so what? Now, I'm grateful, Professor Elstein, for your courage as a constructive and willing to risk your life, giving an example of the so what by interpreting the church to the culture, the culture to the church. And as you end the book, who we are, to love the world enough to want to know it, but as St. Paul would tell us, not to be conformed to it. So thank you. I have a couple quick questions, comments for our speakers, and then we'll throw the floor open for everybody who has a question. No, I don't actually have about 25 minutes. <laughs> Um, I want to say a couple of things quickly about the Baker paper and then a couple of things about the Gregory's paper and uh, the <coughs> to try to, I think, sharpen and, and hopefully um, make more palpable some of what the issues are at the stake here. Uh, first, with respect to Professor Gregory, I actually now use with my undergraduates a wonderful memo uh, that was given to the President, President Truman, on April 25th, 1945, his 12th day in office. Um, Secretary War Simpson came via a secret passage um, into the White House, so he would not be noticed, and gave the President uh, a four-page memo that starts with this sentence, and he sat silently while the President read it. Within four months, we shall in all probability have completed the most terrible weapon ever known in human history, one bomb of which could destroy an entire city. Imagine being a president and receiving a medal like that. I actually encourage you, if you teach undergraduates, you can find this memo. It's a fantastically wonderful memo. You can actually get a replica of the actual thing and inflict it upon your students because this is the kind of thing that Augustinians want to be thinking about politically 
And this is exactly the kind of thing that Professor Digger brings to our attention here. He pushes us on two fronts, um, though with one, I think, strategic aim, to insist on the illustrative power and existential habitability of the Augustinian narrative. And he raises a question along one front about Elshtain's work and pushes an unsettling question both to himself and uh, to Professor Elshtain on another. We say something about both. First, he asks the question about the apologetic prospects of the sort of work that he sees Elshtain undertaking. Does an account which presents itself rhetorically as not primarily and immediately couched in the direct idiom of Christian theology really lead people towards a deeper appreciation of and ultimate assent to that Christian account, as Professor Baker says, does it persuade unbelievers into theology, Christology, and eschatology, um, or does it not rather lead to the downplaying of their peculiarly, of the peculiarly theological moments of the Christian narrative for the sake of retaining plausibility? Now, this may be um, a bit of insider baseball, but I think that all of us who engage in what can broadly be called Christian ethics ought to have this question as one of the questions that are kind of rattling around in your head all the time. Of course, this is a, just the same question as has always been there, because in the beginning of Christianity was the Logos, after all. That is to say, from the very moment when early Christians decided to write in Koine Greek, and not Aramaic, the question of whether Christianity would be a hybrid has been settled. The Jewish communities they were trying to reach with their new teaching could only hear the teaching if it was spoken in a way that they could understand it, which meant in the language of their world. Perhaps the question had been settled before that, though, with Jesus' own words about new wine in new wineskins. And then, of course, there is the incarnation itself, which some of us think is the most daring act of metaphysical miscegenation this cosmos has ever known. If this is so, then the question of whether or not a theological voice has to present itself with some kind of pretensions towards strict purity, as if it has a certain kind of theological pedigree, um, may in fact, this is the Hawazian question I think Professor Baker is worried about, may in fact have gone wrong from the start. That in fact, the prospects for that kind of purity may itself be an illusion of a sinful world. That in fact, the incarnation suggests that larger parts of the world than merely the vocabulary of the uh, inside baseball of Christianity can be and perhaps are in the process of being redeemed. Uh, my favorite example of this is one that actually is visible on the cover of any textbook of Augustine's City of God that is in the title City of God, De Chibitate Dei, right, is actually an interesting use of the word city, which does not primarily mean uh, an urban location. Right? Augustine could have said the Orbis Dei if he had wanted to do that. City, in these terms, is a Roman Republican political term that has a certain kind of, at that point, very, very vehemently pagan uh, vector, a certain kind of semantic density. For Augustine to do that, and then later to start in that book, the very first word of the book being, of course, gloriosissima, most glorious, right? the central axiological term of pagan Roman rhetoric. To do these acts, and then to turn those words to a theological aim in fact, it seems to me, replicates intellectually, rhetorically, and theologically what, in fact, Augustine's basic message is about the incarnation itself. That this world was deemed fit to bear the weight of glory, uh, at least its initial moments, so that one day the whole world would come to recognize the truth of that narrative. So I go on some distance towards the incarnation from this question because I actually think it's a very simple question for Christian ethics and for people like Professor Elshane who want to think very seriously about this. For my money, it's not the person, it's not the general principle of whether to reach out, whether to use different rhetorics, but how you do it. My response to uh, this worry is that a more generic, less granularly um, textured idiom can be uh, can do a great deal of good for all of us, as we are all too habituated into the idioms of a fallen secularist worldview. And on the other hand, even the most vehement secularists will occasionally allow that the claustrophobic immanentism their own worlds is from time to time punctured by vectors of transcendence, be they spiritual, moral, or aesthetic. So I suggest that apologetics is actually not its own kind of thing at all. It's best understood as one form of pedagogics, as it was for all of us. But I'd like to hear uh, Professor Elshay and others talk about this. But the second point 
is, as I said, not a challenge to Elmstein so much as an endorsement and development of her views against prophets who speak from the cheap seats, that is, the irresponsible seats. First, he recognizes that love for Augustine does not have to lure us from the world, but rather turns us towards it more properly. This is, of course, a lesson that Professor Elmstein has taught us as well. Elmstein follows Augustine in noting the ways that this love means that we will be entangled in the near tragic sufferings that constitute the matter of God's inscrutable yet ironic providence when scrolling across the screen of time. There may be some space for conversation with Gregory's paper here as well, um, a point I'll return to in a moment. Uh, but figures not only endorse Elmstein's um, Augustinian insistence on mercy, misericordia, against um, our own various modern stoic apotheos, or modern, modern attempts to remain indifferent to the, the, the forms of suffering we encounter. He suggests that the eschatological gate, so to speak, must swing more freely, and as it were, in our lamentations, it must be louder of political necessity than it currently does. He suggests this in two ways. First, there should be more recognition of our own standing under judgment than currently we admit. And um, a famous passage of City of God 196, which is a bigger um, cites, actually, he, he could have cited more, because at the end, it's not just hand-wringing that happens, but this recognition that the judge needs to cry out from my necessities delivery in the language of the psalmist. Right? So there's this way in which Augustine is saying the tragedies of the judge's activity are actually something that is anticipated and inscribed in the ritual lamentation of the Christian community in this way. He actually says, it's not enough for the judge to feel like, ah, things are tough all over, but in fact, it's better if the judge really feels like this is wrong. And in some, in some sense, it's wrong about the cosmos, not just about me. The just judge is wisest who bewails his sins and begs to God to deliver him from his necessities, but yet recognizes them as necessities still. A second figure says that the appeal to eschatological closure, especially in this question of how final justice is meted out, is often too easy a way out for Christians, um, Christian theologians especially, in speaking to each other. A fact that is seen in the insight he has that, that these same theologians, in bigger words, tend to become tongue-tied and reticent when speaking to unbelievers about this. And I, I have to confess that this is, in fact, true. In at least one theologian's case, I know pretty well. Okay. I think he's right about this, though I suggest in a lesson I learned from uh, Reinhold Niemer and Einstein that there are very good examples of what, of what speech um, loose in a public stage in the words, uh, in these forms might be. Thinking of the words of Abraham Lincoln, especially in the second inaugural, um, and Martin Luther King, especially in his ruminations about the beloved community, both seem to me forms of eschatological speech, which are vibrantly, particularistically theological, and vibrantly, politically, and mentally powerful. Um, I still insist that my graduate students read the second inaugural as part of their graduate exams. That is probably the best, most succinct form of Augustinian theology of history find in the modern world. In fact, as I would say, it is um, some combination of Abraham's brooding on providence and the preacher king that we need now to escape cold-hearted realists and empty-headed prophets. And I'd like bigger and else to than the rest of us to think um, and to find out what else they would say about this. Turning to Gregory's remarks, you see why we're all on the same panel. Where he also uh, picks up the, the, the way that Elstein has done the hard work of thinking about real politics, to borrow one of her titles, but within the context of an ethic of love. Indeed, if one can call her friend Michael Walter, the greatest contemporary Jewish Weberian thinker on politics, which I think is a fair way of describing him, Elstein may be our greatest Christian Augustinian Weberian. Weber is an interesting figure in some ways for a lot of her work. In fact, I would propose to an enterprising graduate student, if there are any, there used to be in my time at Chicago, um, that there are interesting possibilities for dissertation topics, thinking about Walter and uh, Elstein in these, in these ways. As Gregory points out, Elstein highlights the quasi-psychological and psychotherapeutic character of Augustine's critique of Roman Gloria. And again, remember that the first word of the city of God is most glorious. Those applied immediately to the city of God, not to Roman Europe. 
And it would be good to hear El Shnei and um, maybe uh, Eric and Nigel talk about how they think that that diagnostic critique could go forward even today, how we could employ that more explicitly. Gregory, Gregory's questions to uh, El Shnei, I was like Gregory's questions to Augustine, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, about whether definition hunting is a sign of moral corruption, especially with regards to torture. Although, curiously, definition hunting as uh, uh, regards humanitarian intervention turns out to be a necessity for you. So there's an interesting tension there, maybe, and something of what you said, but I'll let that lie. Um, <laughs> are very important questions, and I think uh, it would be really useful for us to hear them. As a final note about that, an interesting irony of our current situation that um, uh, President Obama's, to my mind, far more um, bloody-minded uh, drone campaign which has not provoked the same kind of outcry of outrageousness um, from the precincts and Princeton Theological Seminary that President Bush's Bush campaigns did, um, seems to have been in part driven by a recognition that capturing many of the people um, that would be maybe usefully captured um, actually creates legal and, well, their politicians, let's just say legal issues that they didn't want to deal with. So that there are interesting ways in which the Obama camp, the Obama part of uh, <laughs> Party, Obama administration, um, and I speak as a supporter of Obama, has decided that it's better, in fact, to kill these people than try to capture them and extract information from them. Uh, that, that's possibly including a little too much coherent thought to this policy, but <laughs> it's a troubling fact that I think is worth thinking about for those of us who are, um, in some ways, in support of this. That was said with pastoral sensitivity to the sensitivity to the burden bearers of the world. <laughs> I think it's pretty well, yeah, there's a lot to be said there. It's really interesting. Behind these questions, though, and provoked by uh, Eric's questions, is another one that I think um, we ought to think about as well and bring explicitly to our service. When we ask these questions about torture, about humanitarian intervention, about aiming to kill, do we aim to offer answers to immediate questions, thus find a relatively low level of abstraction offering a few easily transferable general axioms is, are we thinking in casuistic ways? Or do we seek to aim for counsel? That is, to treat the immediate questions or issues as opportunities to draw larger morals, but at a larger distance from the urgent needs of the moment. Do we seek casuistry, or do we seek counsel? And don't tell me like a politician that it's both end. I know that line, and it is both end. But then you have to have to and tell me, where do you start? Do you have to relate casuistry and counsel and thinking about it? Both of these pieces, both of these papers, are pushing the question of these fine grained ethical issues. And yet, both of them, I think, actually want to step back and say that the real weight of an Augustinian theology is not providing a certain kind of moral theological algorithm to solve our problems as time goes on, but rather to give people a mindset and a way of looking at the world which helps them think in very complicated ways, as Professor Elshin has pointed out, about the context of responsibility in which they live. So the question of Kessler Spirit Council. I think sometimes, I think sometimes Professor Elshane is interested in answering, in working in the um, idiom of counsel, and he is occasionally um, critiqued for offering um, counsel. I don't know if that's fair or not, but I think it's an interesting question. Let me conclude. If there's a moment in Augustine in which a plausible Augustinian liberalism might begin to be, it would be, I think, that moment in the city of God where Augustine says that in this life, justice consists more in the forgiveness of sins than in the perfections of virtue. I agree with Robert Lovin that ultimately for Augustine, the limits of politics are eschatological. But as Luther and Elstein, and I think Gregory all know, forgiveness itself is eschatological. So the eschaton, as Ken Lu would say, happens every day. The difference between time and eternity is very definitely real, but it is far messier than a picture of eternity serving merely as a kind of bookend to history. Rather, eternity riddles the canopy of time, which in important ways is how the light gets in at all. Jean's right that politics for Augustine has limits, ends, some of them a matter of themes, some of them a matter of telos. These two fine papers help us to see both how Elfstein's work and engagement illuminate this in Augustine and illuminate those realities themselves. Thank you.
I, I, maybe we do need uh, two or three questions at a time uh, directed at the, uh, the speakers. And I'll, I'll, I'll gather them and then we'll. So, question um, So, the Dirty Hands question I found uh, uh, fascinating. I think it's right. This is sort of generally touching on. And my question, um, my question really has to do with the practitioners of dirty hands and those government officials that are tasked with making these um, lesser evil decisions all the time with imperfect information. And the, the question I have is this question about the eschatological horizon that uh, uh, Augustine in, in 196 has in mind. The reason the just judge can say, forgive me of my necessities or, or release me of my necessities because he knows um, there is redemption at the end of time or something like that. You mentioned that that's kind of an easy out at times for Christian theologians to resort to. Um, my question is, can government, um, and I have in mind specifically City of God where Augustine is saying, He's specifically repudiating this this ancient notion of uh, you know so the way with the whitewashing of this you know washing over these wars that are claimed in the name of uh, honor and goodness and you know he goes on about all these kind of instances and in, you know four twenty five um, uh, can can the kind of practitioners of this sort of, uh, of this judgment do so uh, without that eschatological horizon? Does it does justice collapse into some sort of realism or sentimentality, or how does? Um, I'm wondering. I'm just you know thinking out loud here. The the, the question that was in the back of my mind is: Can, um, can Blair, can Bush, can you know people in those positions not? Um, do they lose tragedy when that uh, when that horizon is lost when? Um, does that tension of tragedy, knowing that the decision I'm making is a tragic one? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Let, 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 let my question really builds on this. Is that one of those ridiculous undergraduate examples that Eric talks about? You're walking through the woods with a hunting rifle, and you see two men in white hoods with a with a group of African Americans type of fence and machine gun. What do you do? Now, you, when you ask students that, they immediately say, well, I don't shoot anybody, I don't want to hurt anybody, and maybe I throw the gun at them. I do, you know, they, they try to find ways, but you force them to make the choice. They almost always like make the choice to shoot the people, to, say, to act as good neighbors, in that sense. You know, it could be mistaken, it might be a movie that someone's making, but, but that, all of those, I don't know, all of them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, but they still did the right, but they just, you can still convince them to make the right real choice. Then the second example, you're walking in the woods with your hunting rifle, and a man comes up to the camera and says, you know, just a mile over there, there are these two blind, there are these two guys in white hoods. They're going to, and you can convince them that they have to go over there to try to help to, to save these people. But then when you say to them, look, I can assure you that there are 10 people in the world that are chained to a fence right now. Right? What should we do? Now, if we were poor and had no resources and weren't able to get there, we'd be let off the hook. But in a certain sense, because we can do something, we feel so. And I, I have to, I have to tell you, I don't know the answer to that question. But, but I think that it, 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 it is really the dirty hands question put in the worst possible way because it means that we have dirty hands all of the time, whether we do something or don't. So I wonder whether Augustine has that. I mean, I wonder what you to think about that, what you three think about that, and Gene as well, obviously. Uh, because I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. And, it, and it, I think it is the real question that we constantly face in foreign policy <coughs> on a daily basis. And in our personal lives. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of those moments where I'm glad that I'm just a chair. Sound <laughs> good? <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, so here's a silence. Those two questions. Um, first of all, uh, your question about dirty hands and tragedy. Um, it, it does seem to me 
that it's easier to recognize the moral ambiguity of something or the tragedy of something if you believe in divine forgiveness. Um, if there is no divine forgiveness, it, it's harder to admit that what you're doing is uh, morally tainted. I guess I, I'm, I'm thinking by analogy to, to the case you've raised from uh, a thought I had when I was looking at uh, um, non-religious pacifism and, and how necessarily the non-religious pacifist has to come up with a, a pretty optimistic view of human nature. Um, has to do that because if, if they can't place their hope in human nature, there is no hope. Right? But the truth is, if you're realistic about human nature, you know, it's not the ground of much hope, really. Um, uh, but because there's no other recourse, because, because you can't trust in the grace of God, it's harder to look evil, it's harder to look reality in its ambiguous and tragic face directly. So by, by analogy, I'm thinking it's certainly easier if, if, if there is a God you can confess to, um, and you believe in, in forgiveness and, and the passion of God for uh, the the big we find ourselves in, it is easier to acknowledge just how messy things actually are. That's just, that's just one response to the question. Then to, 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 to yours on, well, I'll make a start of what I think your question was, so it could be, right, but we, we have the ability to go and mess with all sorts of people. And we know we don't do it consistently, we do it bits and bits and pieces. Um, what do we make of that? Uh, well, sometimes there, there are good moral reasons why we don't intervene everywhere. Um, a, because in some cases, let's say Syria, it's not obvious we can make a positive difference. Um, or because, let's say Rwanda, the French should do it, not us. <laughs> so sometimes there are moral reasons. On the other hand, uh, you know, sometimes the reason we don't intervene in some places is because, frankly, we have no national interest in so doing it. Now, national interest, I don't think, is always a bad thing. I mean, um, uh, there can be justified national interest, but some, sometimes it's just uh, moral and malignant. Um, so, yes, yeah, sometimes our inconsistency is morally unlucky, and we just have to lament it. But not always. Yeah, uh, so mediating your between the two questions, I think, uh, you know, within Christian theology, there is a great debate about this eschatological reference and its implications for ethics. You have the kind of Lutheran strand you know, of sin boldly, and grace is going to be there at the end of the day, etc., so don't have too much anxiety about things. And I think you find this in some of Augustine's sermons. Uh, particularly to uh, his anti-Pelagian sermons, where he was trying to speak to uh, many of the wealthy aristocrats who had imbibed a kind of very earnest moralism that he was trying to uh, help them uh, be relieved of. Uh, there's that other side, though, of Augustine that eschatologically you better fear for your soul, because everything you do shapes whether or not you are moving closer to God or further away from God. And you find that in his sermons as well. Some need to hear the lessons of hope. Some need to hear the lessons of despair. So, uh, you know, I wonder sometimes whether I want wanted Augustine as my pastor, but there is a kind of uh, pastoral dimension where, you know, there's no global theory about how to approach the problem during things. Um, but I do think it is a, 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 it is a big debate in Christian theology whether or not there are moral ones. Genuine. Like tragic, we use the word. Um, you know, my colleague Peter Singer, for example, doesn't believe in moral dilemmas. He can crank out an answer to any situation, like the apparent that he looks and tell you what to do. It's a very demanding morality. And many Christian traditions are, are in that same way, particularly Thomas Day right? But others um, say that um, the oath looks full of that maybe God created a world that confronts us with dilemmas such that we can turn to grace. So, um, 
I'll just I'll leave that there for now. Um, the other thing I think that Dustin does do, which is very influential, he develops a kind of role-specific morality. And many people criticize him for this because the soldier can inwardly maintain the, his conscience while doing things that he's doing under the office of soldier, but not as a qual person Christian. In fact, Augustine, one of my students, has an interesting article in the Journal of Religious Ethics. Augustine, um, from a name line, she famously says, ever to do. In situations where soldiers um, must practice duplicity and other things, it's a complicated case. But this obviously has a long legacy, where in your office you can do things you wouldn't do as a person. So that's another dimension, I think, of, of this whole uh, question. Just quickly on the, the Woods example, I think that is, for me, a really challenging one. I mean, I keep reminding Peter Singer that the Good Samaritan could spend the rest of his life searching the byways of Israel. Right? Um, and even Peter himself, um, you know, incredibly admirable. It, you know, gives 40% of his income to the global poor. I mean, shames Christians in many respects in what he does. Um, the 60% of his income is still bigger than. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think, I think most of these, not, the, the whole question, it, it comes to a point where ethics maybe doesn't have much to say. Uh, he doesn't have a story for us. And maybe they, they, these are questions. The, the, one, the one other move I want to make think about Robin's talk. One thing I think Augustine didn't have really was an imagination for institutions. Somewhat ironically, he was a social thinker, but he knew nothing about the administrative state or the rational state. And in some ways, at least the way I personally think about that is maybe I have duties to institutions that might mediate or mitigate the obligations I have to the distant poor. So if I support institutions that Robin was talking about, that in some ways, it may be uh, in moments of bad faith, Relieves the earnest conscience of uh, um, someone. You know, oh, yeah. May I just pursue this a little more? Because I'm, I'm puzzled. So, what eschatological hope involves is the hope that though by uh, knowingly and deliberately do something wrong, I may confess in the future and be forgiven by God. That's what your Lutheran people sometimes say. I wasn't well, promoting that position myself. It's a degenerate form of Lutheran. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I thought, uh, when you were first talking about it, I thought that the eschatological hope would involve hope that those to whom these necessary evils had to be done um, would somehow have been made good by uh, God. Um, to, to think that what it involves is just the hope that God may forgive me. It's not yet to think very hard about the relation between act and agency that you were, that you gestured at about yourself, um, not trying to say much about uh, her. So uh, that that to me would be the. What do you mean by the, the, that they repeat that line about what it means for you? The eschatological hope means that. Well, I, thought, I thought originally, though, I now think that I misunderstood. Perhaps I thought that what you were talking about was. Um, the hope that those who uh, were on the receiving end of some necessary evil uh, that we thought had to be done uh, could nevertheless um, be uh, cared for by God. Yes, that was. And compensated for the harm they suffered at our hands? We don't have a week of God over what God can accomplish. I don't know that I'm not sure what I want to find the compensation there, but. Um, yeah. This is partially why in 1906 Augustine is talking about the judge begging for delivery from the situation of being in these right. crises, not asking for whitewashing. Right? The, the judge is asking, it is appealing to God not to appeal to God. So I think you know, what I was trying to highlight was the, the familiar realist interpretation is a lament and then doing it. Whereas the end of 1906 might be really delivered from this, which means don't do it. Well, but the judge has done some torture before. It, yeah, that's the confessional past, right? right? But again, I think that raises the question of the judge in his office of vocation as judge. But 
But the obvious thing to answer would be it's not our responsibility to make history turn out right. What do you take that to mean when you say to, to deliver me from this? Does that mean let the person confess without being tortured? Or does that mean let the person die right here and now? So they, I don't have to torture them. Or let me die right now. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand what delivery would mean. I mean, it would mean it would depend on the meaning of, 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 of what it means to have an office in the rest of um, and what, what he understands necessity. Necessity is a really crucial term for him. Um, and he really thinks that, like, President Truman in the Oval Office is constrained in very severe ways, he thinks, by a certain necessity. And in some ways, I actually think that we have a very much more liberated um, political imagination. Right? In the in 1960s, there's this interesting thing that I guess just assumes that the only way to conduct the trial is to torture people. Um, I mean, I think that you don't have to be in shovel go to say, you know, maybe there are other, maybe we can have Gary Mason instead of Pokemon. <laughs> but you're beginning to think that it's a problem, unlike many other Absolutely. No, absolutely. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, you know, convicting the guest here. But, but the question of necessity, he wants to say is a very vital fact about politics, that there are situations. And the right thing for the political actor to do is not to try to game the system. There's, there's no probably not a real solution, right, in the third thing. Maybe that's good. But instead, the issue is just you have to do it. Um, I mean, I think that Augustine thinks of politics as a vocation, and as a vocation, it's a vocation in which there's crucifixion. One of the most vividly Augustinian, I think, although others will disagree, um, vividly Augustinian politicians of our age has been the Archbishop of Canterbury, Ralph Williams, who for the last 10 years has been systematically pillory and crucified. Um, and I think um, that's what he understood his vocation to do with him, uh, to deal with his church. So politics is not success. Like, you don't go into politics to win and be happy. I mean, for Augustine, when he became a bishop, he thought, this is a disaster, this is a calamity. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably true today. Uh, so I think there is this notion of having vocations, right? So some feel a vocation that they might lament. Absolutely. No, it's not no, it's, it's not like you're Sophocles, but that, you know, yeah, you're, you're called to suffer. Everyone's called to suffer in their own way. Well, um, if anyone else has a question before, you should have priority because you've been talking for an hour and a half while we were talking. So, but, but if you don't have a question, I don't want to ask you. Uh, okay, it's, it's a very short um, I mentioned in my, my talk that I was surprised in reading a bit of, of your work how little you refer to the book, Reynold Mimo, actually. And I was surprised why, well, because you know, if I wanted to compare it to, to anyone else, it seems to me that, that you're very likely to be something in the sense. What I'm curious about then is, is how do you see yourself in relation to Mimo? I mean, is Mimo a uh, some the predecessor of yours, or, or are you conscious of, I mean, you obviously refer directly to the question, but are you, are you conscious of Nebo as someone uh, you can follow or someone you diverge from? Curious. Um, well, there is no intellectual puzzle, puzzle here, Nigel. It's very simple. I just didn't read. <laughs> Um, until I had already written a lot of what I have, in fact, written. Um, and finally, I decided for a political theory course to do uh, the Children of Light, Children of Darkness, um, and got a bit interested in Niebuhr at that point, but that wasn't until the, uh, the 1980s sometime. I just, you know, he didn't appear in any of my classes, and I hadn't been... Uh, something had not piqued my interest enough for me to to read him, so I started to read him rather belatedly. Um, I've written more recently, but it, it, these are essays and anthologies and so on that you probably haven't seen. Um, and it, so it's really that it's really that simple. Um, I also think I don't quite have a handle on on Niebuhr and the and his relationship to wider public life in the United States in this sense. It seems to me that people 
ongoing event that we don't have a Reinhold Niebuhr running around right now. Um, and I have a hunch that there could not be a figure like that in the United States at this point, because Niebuhr could simply assume, didn't have to argue the point at all, could simply assume a kind of homogeneous Protestant culture, civic culture, civic religion, um, that he could speak to and draw upon. Um, and he didn't have to deal with some of the pesky issues of uh, the rise when you uh, acknowledge, finally acknowledge, uh, true religious diversity and so forth. Um, I watched an interview with Niebuhr not too long ago that's on uh, YouTube, uh, where he's been interviewed by Mike Wallace sometime in the 1970s. And it's amazing the, the self-confidence with which he speaks. I mean, there's there's no caveats, no, oh, well, we must remember this or we must remember that. And when he speaks of Catholics and speaks of Jews, there's a slight paternalistic edge to it, tongue to it. So it was very much the embodiment of American Protestant civic culture at its best, I would say, but very much that. Um, so I, you know, I haven't found a lot to mine in his work um, where my own work is concerned. Uh, many of the things that he writes about, including the irony of American history, those were issues that were already familiar to me before I read his uh, read his book um, on the topic. So that helps to that helps to account for it. Um, May I, since I have the mic, say, say one thing about um, uh, the torture question, which is such a horrifically troubling one. Uh, one of the targets in my essay was, in fact, um, a kind of legal, legal structure um, that seems to conflate that which is legal to that which is ethical. And I indicate in the essay that Alan Dershowitz's plan or suggestion that you know we should have warrants for torture. If you're gonna to torture someone, you run to a judge and get a, an okay before you do that. Um, that that was a stunningly bad idea. Uh, and that what you wind up doing is normalizing practices that should never be normalized in that way. Um, that it, it, it simply sets up a structure so that more and more things become legal, um, hence permissible, hence ethical. Um, far better to have a messy situation in which, you know, occasionally uh, some, uh, in some fervor, given the state was at stake, um, and uh, the nature of the catastrophe that will ensue if you don't get information. Uh, far better for to have those kinds of occasions from time to time, rather than to have this legal structure where we trot the prisoner in and say, you know, the code tells us that we can, you know, rip your fingernails out or something. Um, I mean, I think that's that's just a horrific prospect. Um, so I it's, not, it's not in the shadows. Yeah, it was, in the, it was in the shadows. It's not normalized. It's not lifted up as any kind of good practice. Um, there, there are some things that we know will never go away, but we can treat them as suspect. Sort of, they're they're unpleasant. They're ugly. They should be sort of sequestered, if you know what I mean. Um, and obviously, should be discussed. Um, and talked about so that they stay properly sequestered, so it doesn't become the norm, similar to the way we do things around here. Um, that was a difficult essay to write as well because uh, the gamut of what we call torture is completely out of control. You know, there are some who say uh, using a loud tone when you're interrogating is a form of torture. Uh, a lot, you know, a loud tone with your voice. Uh, so it covers everything from that to actually horrific infliction of pain. Um, so I figured one needs to distinguish 
and you know, between, I think I call it torture one and torture two, which is a little bit strange, but where, I don't know where the point is, where you move from a pretty tough interrogation into actual torture. But there is a point where you would draw yes, the Yes, absolutely. On the moral side. A a a a absolutely, yeah. Where you just, you just say no matter what kind of information might, might come forth, even this, if a thousand school children are This is this just we just can't yeah, we can't do this. Um, we just can't do this. Now someone might take upon themselves the full burden of doing it. I mean you couldn't stop someone from doing that, but I would certainly be uh loath to say, uh, yeah, under those circumstances, so on and so on. Because then our tendency if we go that direction is to try to specify you know, the, 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 the occasions, and you can never, you can never do that uh, with any real clarity or clairvoyance, because each situation is going to be different in some respects. And, and the fear would be that you would try to map, you know, the messy reality of the moment onto one of your cases, you know, that you say, okay, under this circumstance to do X, Y, or Z. Um, but it's, it's, it's a terribly difficult problem and issue. The Israeli courts actually have adopted a policy of sort of declaring torture wrong. Wrong, yes. But the punishment of soldiers who participated sort of had a yeah. spectrum yeah. of punishments yeah. that admit the yeah. degree. And it's, it's, much, it's much easier to simply say, I'm against it full stop. Um, and just turn away and say, I, I, you know, I don't have anything further to say about the issue or the problem. And I think that sometimes, uh, again, and I believe I say in the essay, a uh, way to keep one's own hands clean or presume one has done so. Um, but um, I don't think that that's the case. Well, please join me in thanking our panel. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.